What's going on, quitters? Welcome to another episode of Don't Quit Your Day Job. I am your host, Maxim Allen. You know me, comedian, photographer, podcaster. Today is January 31st, 2021, and I am joined by a very special guest today. This person is probably one of the first friends I made in New York City comedy, and without him and the things we did together, I wouldn't have this podcast today. So please welcome my good friend, podcaster, comedian, distance runner, Connor Kafia Chain. Thank you. Thank you. I was kind of hoping you would say uh, I'm your only friend that you made in New York. And since then, since I've left the city, you've made zero friends. <laughs> you wish. You wish it, I was that bad at making friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that's just me i'm just projecting onto you yeah <laughs> <laughs> so for for the listeners um connor was my co-host on a show called small town radio that is a since deceased podcast um but you taught me he, connor taught me everything i know about podcasting and audio editing and how to do this i actually so. saw a small town radio sticker here in florida so i'm in florida now uh, i'm sure we'll get into the travels and all that stuff at some point but yeah i'm in florida and reed chuda uh who's a new hampshire comedian is also in the same area tampa as me and i saw a sticker on his laptop the other day our sticker nice yeah Hell yeah <laughs> yeah it was a big thing but you also taught me a few things i feel like i'm fairly stubborn um i'm fairly self-taught in audio and i'm like all right this is the way to do it and then Sometimes problems would come up and you would just research it a little bit. Where me, I would just like, let me bang my head against the wall for a couple of years and see how this goes. Yeah, I, I think my major com- contribution, like saving us, you know, four hours of editing time every episode was, yeah. uh, that was probably the big, big and only one. <laughs> Isotope. Isotope is great. I want to get paid before I plug them. Yeah, so. I mean, totally. But yeah, if you use, um, if you're an audio editor and you're doing podcasts, check out Isotope. And it's, then Isotope, if you're hearing this, pay me and I'll boost it to my you know, dozens wild. of listeners. Um, I don't know. Do you know that I'm a Chaco person? Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. Chaco's rule. Chaco reached. Chaco messaged me on Instagram. This is not a joke. This is. Uh, well, it's not going to be exclusive. I'm going to talk about it on my podcast. Uh, what's up with me <laughs> later? But they I've been I used to post all the time because I knew it. Would, uh, this is off topic right away, but uh, <laughs> I, when I worked at um, Oregon Public Broadcasting, when I was an intern there, I one time posted something of my Chacos, like just a foot, like Chaco pics, and it was like, uh, thanks, Chaco. And this other guy I worked with, I think, was like, man, you look so dumb. Like, why are you doing that? And I'm like, oh, don't worry. Now I'm going to post those every day. And so I would do it every day. <laughs> Just like it would just be like me cooking or like me walking somewhere, all irrelevant times, and I would tag Chaco in them, and they never reached out to me. And then Reed and I were actually doing just running through some jokes in my backyard here in Florida, and um, he posted a picture of me, and I was like, "Damn, that guy, that comedian looks good in Chacos." And I tagged him, and then Chaco got back to me and saying, "Yeah, he does," with a wink. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, this means so much to me. And they're like, thank you for supporting the brand. I'm like, let me know if I can do anything to support you all in the future. They're like, we will. We'll keep you in mind. And I'm like, I hope you're telling the truth because the next question is once I hit a certain number of followers or something, is can I be uh, either a model, sponsor, whatever? That would, if you became a Chaco sponsor, it would be amazing. I That's, would be like, you gotta, you gotta get me some on the cheap for I real. Think, I think for listeners, what they should take away is, when someone tells you not to do something, double down to piss them off, and then brands will <laughs> like you. <laughs> I had a I had a similar experience a couple weeks ago. Um, on this show, episode twenty with Joe Kimbrell, we talk about uh, her career in like uh, live music photography, and she had a story about how she took pictures of Public Enemy with like Flavor Flavor Flav. Mm-hmm. So when I posted the Instagram. Uh, announcement the episode had come out i put in some of the pictures she took of these different artists and one of them was a flavor flave i tagged public enemy in the photo 
and they they liked and commented on the picture from the official account with like 250,000 followers or something. That's wild. And it was just a bunch of fire emojis and I was like I am honored that I- someone like recognizes that this is even here <laughs> yeah that's the thing too i realized with um uh chocolate they have like three hundred fifty thousand followers which is like but it also that's what it should be like we've so i've connected with some charities here in florida giving back through uh curbside comedy and they're like we can't you know promote you explicitly but we can comment and share posts that you put so I think that's mm-hmm. a large part of the marketing strategy for these companies. Like, we're not gonna you know, post, but we're gonna interact. Yeah, which yeah. makes sense. That's... I mean, look at how much we're talking about it. They literally took two seconds. They're like, "Yeah, I guess this is okay." <laughs> they took two seconds so, to comment. I think it was someone was I've bored at work. Five minutes of the podcast talking about them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was. I'm sure that's like maybe right before lunch. Like, oh, I got to do one more thing. Oh, this person posted something. Let me do the bare minimum. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I love it. I love the bare minimum. <laughs> so besides a future uh, ch- uh, Chaco rep, um, what are your plugs right now? Um, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Connor underscore Kfiachain. I'm sure you'll put those in the post. So I don't need to spell it and waste our yeah, valuable air they'll be time. In the, they'll be in the description. Um, and... Yeah, I'm getting bigger on I'm I'm trying to do more on both of those. Um and YouTube uh by my channel Karnak Fiat and I have a podcast I've been putting on there. And uh also breaking news for your podcast, February, I believe I'm going to go full send on trying to get onto Survivor. Ooh. So look for that content across social media platforms. It's gonna be fun. I've been trying to brainstorm around it for a little bit. Um, I for Christmas have been applying to be on the show for my mom. My mom's a big fan of the show. She always thought I would do well. And I'm like, you know what? I have three years worth of applications. Let's just have some fun. Let's have a good time. <laughs> Hell yes. Uh yeah. So check out Connor's uh podcast, What's Up With Me, follows Instagram, go to his curbside comedy shows and um root for right. him on Survivor when he gets on. There. <laughs> So I should also mention that uh, Curbside Comedy is... uh, Connor is the other half of Curbside Comedy um, with Trevor Glassman, who is on episode seven of this podcast. So if you want to hear other Curbside stories, check out episode seven. Yeah, that's... uh, I'm sure we'll get into that stuff. Yeah. Uh, It's been very interesting. We were talking about it before, but yeah, it's... uh, Man, comedy, comedy in a pandemic fascinating topic oh yeah i i like i could put together like a huge episode just about like outdoor and pandemic comedy but it i don't want to do that much editing so (laughs) (laughs) so uh connor so you are in a nutshell like comedian podcaster also do like freelance audio video type stuff yeah Let's start from the beginning. Where are you from? Oh, the very beginning. You're like, let's talk about your interests. Where are you from? (laughs) Yeah, it's a little bit of a curveball, but it kind of, it kind of like, I don't know. It has a linear progression. Let's talk about your jobs. What type of sandwich are you going to have for lunch today? (laughs) (laughs) No, I I mean, for anyone who's listened to Small Town Radio, one, thank you. And two, you you know my hometown is Hampstead, New Hampshire, Um, the greatest city. This greatest town talked about on small town radio, um, arguably the first place in the country to have a honey factory, arguably, (laughs) no, not arguably, definitely the best place in the country for Crab Rangoon. Um, That's my hometown. (laughs) I, my parents and I and my siblings lived there till I was 18 and then they moved to Exeter, New Hampshire. Um, But New Hampshire, born and raised, live free or die, 603. Um, God. Very you, white okay. place. <laughs> All right. N- next, next fall question. How old were you when you first got into comedy or broadcast or like any of these things that you're into now? Yeah. So that's it's. I think I've always had an interest. Um, like, there's different points in my life that I can look back at and say, "Oh, this this was a tipping point. This is how I got interested." I would say, 
I mean, my my childhood uh, into the later teenage years was all about running. I was an athlete. Um, mm-hmm. That's like that was my personality. I was athlete, male athlete of the year when I graduated. Um, I thought for a long time like I was going to go the to college to run. I was going to like take that as far as I could stay like either being an athletic trainer or a coach. Um, so it was like, that was really the, the direction my life was headed. And, um, but there were moments. So like in middle school, I did the lip sync and I did it three years with some friends in the third year. We were like, screw it. We're not doing just one song. I'm going to make a mix. I remember spending like days cutting up songs, putting them together and so that was my introduction to audio editing. And yeah. like, so I was like, like, what is that? Eighth grade? Eighth grade. Yeah. Eighth grade. Mm. Um, I'm sure all of that's very illegal. What I did, like copyright infringement galore. You definitely mm. cannot do that. But you know, who's going <laughs> to find, the, who's going to go to an eighth grade lip sync and be like, hey, your act was bad, but the crime you did was worse. <laughs> 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 um. So there's a little bit of that. And then um, comedy, I was just like, I was always interested in it. Um, but I got injured my junior year of high school and I couldn't run for six weeks. And if your life is built around something and not only are you not able to do it, but you're not able to be around the people that you do it with, you start to look at life very differently. And, and that's called comedy, folks. Yeah. And that's it for today's episode. <laughs> Tragic. <laughs> <laughs> so they uh so i started actually writing like poetry and stuff during that time more creative writing and mm-hmm. um by the time i got to college i was like screw it I, because of that the world kind of opened up i realized there's other things that i could do and by the time i got to college i was recruited and i was just like this isn't the right fit like i don't want to be starting this path forever there's got to be something yeah. more um and then bat junior year sophomore year of college i didn't want to go back so that summer i was looking at taking some time off uh i got super depressed i was dating a girl that wasn't uh didn't treat me probably the best way and um i was it's ironic because i started running a lot again i was running like 60 miles a week trying to get onto the team Mm -hmm. uh university of oregon great track team in hindsight, there's no way that I was going to be able to walk on after not running for three years. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, that year, I started looking at comedy more seriously. And um, when this girl and I did break up, I literally replaced all the time I spent with her at a radio station. So it was like very much filling a void. Uh, mm. It was a what coping radio mechanism. Station? Yeah, it was just like a coping what what radio station did you get into? KWVA. Is that the u- university radio station? Yeah. Um Willamette Valley is okay. Is the uh WV. I don't what was the A for? But yeah, college radio. <laughs> I so I joined the radio station and within 6 months I was news director, not because of any Not because of what I did for the lip sync before, but because our team was so small. We had six people there. And I was the only, I was one of two people who applied for the job and I was the Mm. only journalism major. So they're like, that's all you really needed. (laughs) So what what inspired you to go for the radio station? So it was that summer. Um, I was really into music. So I guess I liked performing. I did the lip sync. I played guitar a lot. Um... After this breakup, though, like I stopped writing, I stopped, um, I stopped playing music, stopped reading a whole bunch, and mm. um, what kind of what I did was like, if I'm going back to school, I decided not to take the year off. I'm like, I'm going to go full full into journalism. So mm. I applied to the school paper, I applied to the radio station, and um, I think like I was doing like. Duck TV, which was the University of Oregon's like um, screenwriting type thing and acting type thing, and uh, it was kind of just what stuck. I so I was yeah I was the enter I was a student activities reporter for the for the school paper, and it was at the radio station. And then 
uh, I was just weighing what I liked more and I liked the radio station more than an opportunity to make a little bit of money, a very, very, very little bit, like 2% of minimum wage. And um, wow, you know, being a leadership role came up. And so I said, mm-hmm. let's just go full force into this. And uh, I'm the type of person who, if I do something, I'm going to go at it head on. And uh, geez, I spent so many hours in that radio station. So it was just like, it's just kind of what stuck, whatever opportunities opened up. Yeah. And I just went for it. So what, when you were at the radio station, this is kind of like the beginning of your like podcast experience in a way, yeah. right? So what kind of, what were your duties like at the radio station? Yeah. So I was a news director and to put it into perspective, we had a team, I believe it was six people and we did six shows, six new broadcasts in 10 weeks or 11 weeks, our term. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and we had up to six half an hour spots a week. Okay. So we had a ton of time, um, but we weren't filling it. So basically, um, my training was here's the re- cut, here's select. That's how you edit. And you can basically record whatever you'd like and put it on the radio. So it was my, <laughs> because we had a small team, I was in charge of both making the content, um, editing the content, and then broadcasting it. And what was your content at the time? What were you going for? So we had we were trying to develop some shows. We were trying to develop programming. And so we had, uh, I guess technically we had more shows because we had someone else, our student government came in and did a show during our slot. So I guess those were technically new, but like not creative pieces. So we did we developed a show called You Own the News, which is like a round table discussion of news, national, local, and school news. Uh, mm-hmm. We did something called Story Time which was like creative, like kind of a catch all. They did some ASMR. They talked about like, um, uh, what else they did? It was all it, fart noises. It was, yeah, <laughs> it was, it was just like, I don't know, creative writing pieces sometimes yeah. too. And then we had an arts and culture section. Um, and then we had did like some more bigger interviews for guests that came onto campus. Um, but we were trying to develop that programming and then we eventually grew to a size where you could sustain that programming and then mm-hmm. hire new people. Um, but so it was just like, just trying to do whatever we can to fill the space. And then once we could, how to shape that space and like make yeah. it a good show. And how, how long were you at the radio station for? Um, so I was January of my junior year to when I graduated. So 18 okay. months. Or so nice, just over, I guess, with the time did, before. But and when did does comedy start around this time? Yeah, kind of. Um, I did a so the first inkling was shortly before that. Uh, the first time I got on stage was the talentless night at our basement. Uh, in our like, I, so I was an RA, which if you are just listening and just meeting me. Um, if and you need a description of who I am as a person, RA describes me to a T. It's perfect. It's, You've got big RA SNL energy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we had a talentless night, and uh, a few weeks ago we had to like tell a story of our life, and I got people laughing doing that. So I was like, oh, I feel a little a little confidence. So let's try it out. Someone came up to me and said, "Are you doing the show?" And I said, "I'll do it if you do it." And he's like, "Okay." And so I did it, and I had to. Uh, I went on stage and I said, I'll answer three questions. I forget what the first question was. The second question was, how do you, how do you like your toast? And the third question was, where do babies come from? So this mm-hmm. is the authority figure of the dorm having to answer, you know, a freshman in college, sophomoric question. And my response was, there's my boss. Why don't you ask her? <laughs> and uh, it got well, a big uh, laugh. Bad, bad move number one, if you're looking to get into stand-up comedy, never go up on stage and say, ask me questions. Oh, yeah. Don't this do is, that. So th- that was the first time. The second time I went up, I went to a place called Wild Duck Cafe right off campus. And I was like, you know what? This worked the first time. I was at a bar and I was like, ask me three questions. And someone goes, why are you wearing Chacos? And I go, well... New Hampshire has a high heroin overdose rate. 
<laughs> and chacos are sick okay <laughs> i chacos get a lot of hate from people in new york city who see them no chacos are the greatest sandal to ever exist yeah they were gr- i mean oregon was like kind of pro chaco but that was the time i got on so that was you know six months before the radio station but that was i don't think i went on stage again uh until after the radio and then i started to get a little bit more serious but it was a uh, it was one of those things where like I've always had interest. I've always liked writing. Let's try it out. And then I learned quickly that I'm very bad at it and I want to get better. <laughs> that's good though. I mean that's that's how you start it. I think uh I started stand up with the I with the idea that okay, I know even before my first time, I was like, I know I'm gonna be terrible at this and it's gonna take a while for me to be good at this. So I'm just gonna strap in and see how it goes. I think that's the the thing that I didn't understand the first time I did it was the reason why I got the laughs at the like the talentless night is because everyone already knew me and they had some yeah. connection to me. They're like, oh, that's that goofy guy. Um, and we're seeing him make a fool of himself. But if you're strangers watching someone make a fool of themselves, you're like, oh, I just feel sad about that person. That person's ruining my life right now. Like, is that what mm-hmm. I look like to strangers? Yeah, it's... Uh... I think that's something that it takes time to learn, but like comedy isn't just your jokes. It's your connection to the audience and how well they understand the context of you as a person and like what they feel about you and how like you understanding how they perceive you as a performer. It's like this yeah, weird feedback loop where when you start, you're kind of just doing a monologue into a void and hoping that people connect with it. But later, it's like a conversation more so. Yeah. And it, do you feel this way, too, where, like, you didn't... Well, I don't know. I kind of know your story about getting into it. But did you feel like there's a part where you're... Part of time where you're doing stand-up, you're like, I'm doing stand-up. And then there was that moment you're like, I'm actually going after this. I I think it was in the beginning, actually. Like, it was, like, the first time I did stand-up, I was, like... It was like heroin. I was like, I am going in on this. And then within, I think within like four or five months, that's when I decided I wanted to come to New York City and like change shit up and like make it happen for real. Well, you're a very intentional person. When you choose to do something, you you do it. And that's yeah. It, you know. the, the problem is uh, choosing something. <laughs> <laughs> well, comedy chose you. You didn't choose yeah. comedy. Well, exactly. Uh, what about you? Did Did you have that moment? So yeah, I was. I didn't do. I was in Florida. Actually, it's really weird. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes people look at their life and they look back and go, "How have I grown in the last two years?" Uh, two years ago, I was in Florida, pretty much doing the exact same thing. <laughs> I was down here and um, I I decided to just not go right into the the job search right after college because I had an internship and um, I was in Florida and I just had the time. I was like, let's let's do this. Like, let's try and go to comedy. So it was two years later that I really was like, let's write something. Let's try and work on your jokes. Um, and you know, really work on that muscle of getting better. So there was that moment, but it wasn't. It wasn't until I really had the time to think and think about what I wanted. Um, mm-hmm. But it was always there. I think it was like a slow build underneath. Yeah. Now I, I remember when I first met you. You had just moved to the city up from Florida. I was like, well. I was in New Hampshire, but I was in the Florida. I was in Florida for as long as I was in New Hampshire. But there was like Florida was still very much part of like where were you before this? Yeah, and also um, I, I do want to mention that uh, at my mic yesterday, uh, people were talking about Florida, and a comedian mentioned that there's a place named Christmas, Florida, and I had to restrain myself to not be like my podcast did an episode about that. Check out Small Town Radio. <laughs> I, I mentioned Christmas, Florida, to a Floridian the other day, and they had never heard of it. I was just, they're like, is that real? I'm like, why would I lie to you about Florida? And then why <laughs> like, would I make up that lie? Like, if, if I wanted to lie about Florida, I would do something much better. There are so many better lies you could come up with. But, like, I would have been like, boy, do I have an, a podcast for you to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, uh, well, it was interesting. So I did, I hosted a mic in college. Um, mm-hmm. 
and you know working at the radio station as many hours I, as I did, I would usually invite those people. And the reaction was always the same. Whenever a friend came, they would always just go, oh, you were better than I thought you'd be. Oh, I got that a lot. Which yeah. is the, they weren't like, you were good. They're just like, I thought you were going to be real shitty. You were just bad. I was like, oh man, what, your expectations were so low. Yeah, I I think that happens to a lot of people, especially with, I think everyone in our society thinks professional comedians are like really cool. But when you hear someone in your life does stand up comedy, you go to the old like stereotypes where like, oh, they're a loser. They're going to be broke. They're not going to be that funny, whatever. Like I had it where I went to an open mic once and I had two friends come who had never seen me perform because we were going to go get food afterward. And I did my set and I did really well. And afterward, one of them was like, wow, you are actually like so good. And we like left and they were like, I actually feel cool hanging out with you right now. And I was like, wow, (laughs) what a compliment. Like (laughs) there is that that weird thing, right? I, uh, I, I actually view it a little bit different. Where it's like, I think people, because they see so much professional stand-up, their expectations are so high. They don't see the process beforehand. Yeah. They like, just see the, the final process product on Netflix. But there is something, there's some social currency to doing stand-up. Um, and sometimes it's annoying. Like, any having too much currency of anything, it can be annoying because people will be like, oh, you need to tell me a joke. Or like, yeah, I don't know, like on dating apps, you'll see people like, I need someone who can make me laugh. I'm like, I'm never, no, like, I don't. I, it's different. Like you're gonna find out I'm a comedian. You're gonna, like, it just feels feels like people want to hang out with you. They want to experience that, and then they see what it's actually like, and they learn about the process of going to these mics, working on the jokes, having consume your life, and they're like, "Oh, that's not beautiful and funny. That's kind of sad and depressing." <laughs> and then we look at them and go, "I don't care. You're boring." Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I. There's also something too is like if people come to open mics, you're like, I only want you to come to one ever. Or like one yeah. every few months. Like the magic the you, you if you're around comedians, you learn very quickly that the magic fades. Yeah. Because we're working on the same things over and over. We're going through hard times figuring it out. It's not like, oh, I show up and make people laugh and then I get on Netflix. It's like you spend decades building something. Yeah. I like This is my advice to like new comedians is when you start comedy, you're going to get on your first comedy show and you're really going to want to invite all of your friends who haven't seen you perform. You only get one comedy show that people will come to. Yeah. So save it for like when you start getting good and you like, I don't know. It's like the thing where the uh, art, the stand up comedy subreddit, like, in its rules it's not a rule but it's a suggestion that's like if this is your if you're gonna post a video of your first time doing it you might not want to post that like (laughs) yeah the um i know you're a big fan of bringer shows right you're like all for them right you just love those bringer shows newer comedians never do a bringer show i'm telling you right now connor might say the opposite situationally but never they're a fucking scam maxim's lying right now you should see him he's grinning like a like a little kid on christmas he's like i'm pulling it over on these people i love bringer shows no buddha no bringers that's the motto Uh till i die (laughs) i so my my um we're we're getting into comedy right away here but i so i i uh, I pre I approached bringers in a very specific way and it actually has paid off a little bit. So yeah. I um I decided that I was going to do one probably one every quarter. Obviously that's changed cuz I'm not in New York, so that's not a thing anymore. But I was going to do one every quarter in different places with different backdrops cuz I figured that's enough time for me to grow and strengthen my set and then I could use the videos to help with future bookings cuz I I want nice film and i've actually been able to use some of the bringers i had even though my jokes like i'm so much better as a comedian now than when i filmed them but i have some jokes and some good crowd moments and like nice enough film where i've actually been able to stitch some stuff together for a hosting reel so for me it was not so much like about the crowd but as much as what i can take from it from the future and how will this how it's like a business decision almost like how is this going to help me in my business of comedy move forward 
Yeah, I mean, I I understand that. Like the tapes and having a tape in a real place is like it's good. It it's like yeah. having a nice like it's like having good stiff paper for a resume, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's something but, like professional and validating about it, but like there's other ways to to get there. Yeah. Um Yeah. Are we, are we still talking so, about the radio or are we uh Yeah, we're kind of bouncing around here. Let's see. It's, so, it's just I feel like with us, we always just end up back at stand up. There's always Yeah. I mean, it's like guys that are listening, like me and, and Connor, girls and girls, everyone who's listening, dudes, dudettes, dude duties, which is dude they's, I guess. I don't know. But uh all all the pronouns, everybody who's out there, uh when Connor and I would do small town radio. We would always get on the podcasting equipment and talk for like an hour <laughs> before yeah. we recorded the episode. <laughs> Same thing happened today. We got a good 45 minutes in. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's but, also because uh, my friendship, uh, making friends in a pandemic is a challenge. Oh, yeah. So when I talk, I talk. I'm <laughs> becoming longer and longer winded. I'm becoming my mom over the pandemic. I love my mom, so that's not bad, but... <laughs> Um, so uh so i guess you started comedy in college you go radio station and then you do stand-up comedy right or yeah yeah. so there's it it was i was interested um in comedy i would tell people at the time that i'd want to write for the daily show um because it kind of fit journalism and comedy and uh, like weekend update for snl all those things that kind of combine research and humor yeah and um after my first six months at the radio station, I decided to start a podcast called Good News, a podcast that was trying to infuse humor and news. Um, and it did, it did fairly well. I think what I learned from the radio station is how easy it is. Like, you don't need a whole lot to record a podcast. Um, yeah. You know, it's like anything. You put more money into it, you're going to get a better quality product. But it, it was fairly minimum. So I had a friend, Matt Gady, who... I, you know, he's just, you don't have those friends. You're like, this guy just knows what he's doing. Like, Mm -hmm. I like hanging out with him. And so we started a podcast and we eventually um, added a third co host, Olivia Howe, who was on Small Town Radio, who's just like an awesome person. It's just like one of those people you meet. um, And she's like, ah, man, this person's just going to figure something out. Like, they're figuring it out. She was really cool. She's so she's in New York too. And I remember like we went out for a drink one night just to catch up. And I was just like, you're just the type of person like I want to work with. You're just, yeah. you're just like cool. You're well, not like you're well versed in what you want and just have like a good sense of humor. Um, yeah. So she, we started that. She was, she was awesome. She came on an episode of Small Town Radio, but she was a wonderful guest right away. And she made, well, she made fun of me right away, which I think always yeah. endears <laughs> uh, the guest, you to the guest. So we did that. And that's when I like started to think about podcasting, like other possibilities of audio and how it works. Yeah. So you, what kind of, what what did you th- what was the um what was your first episode of Good News a podcast like cuz this is your first episode of your first podcast yeah that was so i had an idea for it the idea for podcast was rebalancing the news and matt is way better versed in the news than me um he was just like he's one of the people that just read the new york times every day um yeah. but the idea came up at the end of the school year and I was, I decided to go home. I think Matt was, I think Matt went home too. Matt lives in California and we were texting for a while. And then we're just like, let's do it. Like he has some equipment. I have some equipment. I have a mixer. So we was kind of like this, a remote recording. Yeah. Um, I'd scripted something. And what was the first? We, we tried to keep it relatively short. It was a full scripted. Um, we did a breakdown of the news. We did like 60 seconds of the news headlines. Um, and then we did three or five longer good news stories, and then we did a feature piece. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it was just like uh, the store, the feature piece was on why good news sell, why bad news sells. And like, yeah, is it, um, there are statistics about like having three headlines, similar headlines where it's like, um, 
good positive news, neutral news, and bad news. And the number of clicks on the bad news on those stories was like 30 to 60 times higher. It was just, wow. We're, we like hearing the bad news. So I tried to look up some of the psychology and so we scripted it, put it together. But um, as with any podcasting, as you know, the sound quality when you're starting out is something you need to figure out. <laughs> what um, were you guys recording on? So he, he might have a, I think we, I mixed some minus him into my mixer that I had. I had this microphone and uh, uh, a mixer, not the H6 recorder that I have now. And yeah. um, so whatever his signal was coming in through over the internet, I think it was FaceTime. I was through my phone into the mixer and then into the mix. And I think we even recorded it together. So everything was in there. Like you couldn't, I didn't oh understand cleaning either. Um, and it sounded really, really scripted. You could tell. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was, it, it was like, it was decent. We got like 30 or something. Uh, r- listens. The first week, it was like it was super. It was just exciting because we like figured out how to get our stuff on iTunes. Yeah, started promoting it. Um, but you know, then then the next episode, the reality sets in of like, how many of your friends can you really convince to listen to your podcast? Right. <laughs> um, but it it actually so I then I went to London, so we weren't going to be in the same area for a while, and I think that was the decision why we decided to do long distance at first. Uh, yeah. and then we tried to do one in London when I was in London and he was back at school in Eugene and it was just like, this is unsustainable. Let's not try and do, do this. And during that time, I was studying documentary making. I made a documentary called, um, working comedian. It's on YouTube. I have never really done promotion for it, but, um, so that's when I got into like the multimedia stuff. But we also, during that time, I, I looked before I came home from the semester abroad and we had like 300 listens on our latest episode. Yeah. And like at 150 listens in one day. And we're just like, what's going on? Mm-hmm. And uh, it turns out that Cards Against Humanity had put out an ad for their podcast that they were going to be releasing that had almost the exact same name as ours. So people got very confused and just started listening to our podcast. <laughs> Such a random stroke of luck. It it was, and the wild thing is, uh, we got back, we brought Olivia into the mix, and we released the podcast again. This is my senior year of college, and we got onto Anchor, which is now owned by Spotify's top yep. podcast on the rise, number one spot for like fourteen days. Like wow. when, as soon as we released, we blew up, um, and then we were featured on their Medium article as a top podcast of the week. And we were doing really, we were getting like 800 or so listens, um, an episode, but we couldn't figure out how to make our schedules work. So we started missing episodes and our whole, all the momentum that we had built just started to disappear. And that's very discouraging when you're trying to balance your time and you go, well, I can either focus on school or focus on this podcast. That's a losing steam. Right. Um, so we kind of missed our opportunity with that. And I don't know, like, Good News of Podcast just popped up in back. Like, I've pitched it to Reader's Digest, um, and it has, like, I took a long hiatus, and people were still finding it. Some episodes have, like, 1,200 listens, and all of them have been in, like, the middle of the pandemic. Like, you're finding this, like, the the toughest thing, though, has been there's, like, 300, 400 people who listen to it regularly, but none of them, and I I do a call to action, like, send me your good news. Zero engagement, zero yeah. engagement from 400 people. Like, I know you're out there. I know you're unique listeners. I know you listen to this because you love it. You do not know me because I do not do a good job promoting this. Yet you don't, when I'm like, hey, you need to send me something for this show to go on. No one wants to do that, which yeah. is, you know, I think balancing everyone, that. Everyone thinks, everyone thinks someone else will. <laughs> Yeah, maybe that's it too. But just, I also think at the end of the day, I love stand up, and that shows really doesn't isn't great for humor outlet. Yeah, I've never figured out that piece, so I'm just like, I can't 
dedicates time to something that I don't truly love, especially if I yeah. haven't figured out how to make this work for me mm-hmm. um, in my goals. So how was, uh, what were some of the early lessons you learned from doing that podcast? Consistency is key. Yeah. Um, you need luck, plenty of luck, because we believed we had a good idea, but we would have never gotten to the audience we did without someone, a lot of people mixing up our name. And the fact is, yeah. once people did mix up our name, we retained a lot of those listeners and we built a dedicated following. Um, so you need luck. You could, you could have a podcast that's you think is really good, but you just haven't had the break yet. So that doesn't mean it's not working. It just means you need to have that break come along. Right. Um, and all that said, the third piece is you need to focus on marketing. Like once you get yeah. that audience, you need to figure out how to engage them, how mm. to capitalize their involvement um, and build that network because those are the people that are going to, you know, make it a success in a monetary sense or um, other, you know, professional senses. Yeah, absolutely. I think the marketing is the harsh reality that we always fall back on with these podcasts. It's like, oh, it's going to be so much work to get this out there. <laughs> well, we, we talked about a podcast too, and they were talking about how to grow it and make money from it. And they were like, their first piece of advice is like, you just got to remember, you have to treat it like a day job and you're going to spend 40 hour weeks doing just the marketing. And we're like, yeah. Well, like, and I, when I listen, when I listened to that podcast, they were in a very niche industry with a very niche topic where I was oh like, God. that's that's how you guys got an audience because you found a field where no one else was doing a podcast and you just did a podcast about that specific thing. Yeah, they do talk about an email list, which is something um, I've actually had some loose success with. So I know we're going to talk about it later, but Curve Psych Comedy, I've started building an email list. And mm-hmm. we've had, and it's just a way to keep reminding people that you're there. And we had our first, or no, it was our second show. Um, it was at a nursing home. And they reached out to us months later, uh, Trevor and I. And we're like, can you make a video for our residents for Thanksgiving? And I was like, oh, I never would have thought you would have read this stuff. But she had replied to right. my newsletter. Yeah. And so it was just one of those things reminding like, oh, no, these do keep people remembering that you're a thing it keeps you in their uh, in their thoughts so there was value to it um Mm -hmm. so it's just it's like it's one of those things too where you're just not going to see the rewards until they actually show up so you don't really know what's working and what's not yeah and uh no totally i think the the mailing list is like a big one that's like underrated in a lot of ways but yeah we never uh, did that for the next piece of action between then and now, which is yeah. small town radio. <laughs> There's, yeah, I mean, so what happened between the end of, oh, one of the ends of Good News of Podcast and then graduate Florida, started doing stand up seriously, uh, back to New Hampshire where I coached and then moved to New York and I met you and you approached me with a podcast and do you remember the what i said to you like kind of the requirements and like if we're going to do a podcast together what's these are like the things that we should really think about i don't remember exactly but i think i i think we were kind of on the same page is like one i didn't want a podcast where we're just shooting the shit we're yeah. just like just talking about whatever like that is not a good idea it has to be an original topic with a theme and a direction Mm-hmm. And then I think the the second one was um I I'm imagining it was something about consistency like just we have to do this weekly yeah and then um I don't remember I don't remember if there was any more but that was kind of like the big I, two I think that was it yeah because I remember saying like you know same like not just shooting the shit like we need to have some hook and it needs to be something that you can do something that you're interested enough in to do it week after week right it has to be like repeatable like a bunch of times yeah and it's it needs to like pique your interest enough where you're like oh i've done 20 episodes and i'm 
bored. Like we've exhausted it. Right. Um, yeah. And then we kind of figured out the, the recording situation from there. Um, oh man. Yeah. That was, so that so was small town radio. Like you don't like, if you want to hear the whole story of small town radio, just go to small town radio. And there's, it's the final episode I think yeah. is like the one where we talk about the whole lifespan of it. But, yeah, it was uh it was a learning experience because it's one of those things where I think it reminded me cuz we had an interesting editing dynamic where I edited it all yeah. at the beginning and there was some points of frustration then you did it and then there was points of frustration and then we found a dynamic at the end. Yeah. Um but it's also one of those things looking back now where I go you kind of need to be okay in your life to be able to take on a hobby that takes on more time. So it doesn't feel like you're yeah. taking away from other things that you could be doing. Right. Um, Th- that was kind of the wall we hit where it was like you and I were both really busy doing stuff. Yeah. And for the amount of time it took to put together small town radio and like the research that went into it ahead of time, it felt like it was just like we weren't getting the return on the amount of listeners we had. Yeah. That was after after like we were at forty. We ended at forty six episodes, which is pretty good. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm happy with it, and people who listened to it loved it. Yeah, I I mean Jack Swimer, um, who if you listen to Small Town Radio, know uh, he he actually he came to a curbside comedy show later. He designed the curbside comedy logo. Oh, really? That's dope. And I have a big thing, like as a freelancer. I make sure that everyone feels comfortable asking for the money they want and that I pay them because I know on the other end of freelancing, those people who try and take advantage of your time and right. who don't value you paying them. I believe that if you pay someone, they're more likely to pay someone else and that person is more likely to pay someone else. So it benefits everyone. Yeah. So, um, but Jack, I, I really want to pay for someone to do a logo for Curbside Comedy, but he said, and I, that's why I didn't reach out to him initially, but he had said, uh, because you've provided so much free entertainment for me, I'm happy to do this for you. And it made me feel oh, better. That's so nice. He's oh my guy. gosh. We put in 200 hours of work, 200, 300 hours of work probably yeah. into small town radio. And it's, I love that you got a, a logo out of it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a good logo. That's no, he's a good that's guy. That's dope, though. That's a that's a great way to look at it, though. That's that's so cool. So Jack Swimer, if you're listening to this one, thank you again. <laughs> yeah, him. Um, actually, someone I don't know if I ever told you this. Someone else reached out to me, um, and her name's Jackie Jackie Ignacio, and I was an RA with her, and she said I we were on her Spotify Wrapped, one of their top podcasts. Oh, really? And wow. She said, listening to it and seeing that I was into stand up comedy, she started taking, she wanted to get into comedy. And obviously, mm. during the pandemic, she couldn't go to Mike. So she started taking classes through Second City. Oh, which is cool. Um, but it's also like, oh, I see you doing comedy. And I, you, it's one of those things, it's very flattering, but you could also look at it and be like, oh, if he can do it, I definitely can do it. <laughs> <laughs> which is not think, how she did, meant it at all. But I just think it's funny. I think- like with me, I got drawn into getting started in stand up comedy because I started listening to comedy part podcasts and they started talking about stand up. And I was like, oh, this is something I kind of thought about for a long time. And this sounds like really cool to get into. Yeah. So I think that might have been it where we just like talked about comedy a lot on that show. So it's yeah. probably like a gateway of like, whoa, these, these guys, like, this sounds like a fun thing to do or like a good creative outlet or whatever it was. So. I don't think it's a, if this guy can do it, I can do it. No, I de- <laughs> she's not that type of person, but it's one of those things where if you hear enough, oh, that's better than I thought. Yeah. Then you're like, <laughs> yeah, well, well. <laughs> also, I will say that um, uh, we had another listener that listened to us that much and never sent us fan mail. <laughs> Who was it? Jackie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No listener mail. Well, that's the like, thing where it's like, I don't know. How to m- motivate people and mobilize people is very interesting because I always thought it'd be like you give them a shout out. That's like how those things are. That's why people call into radio shows. But yeah. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's like they just, I, I don't know. I'll tell you what, I got 
two submissions read on a podcast I listened to, and I was like over the moon. I was like, this is so cool. Like, yeah, why would I not send something in? <laughs> Maybe we should just turn this whole episode into a promotion for supporting artists. Engage yeah, exactly. with them, buy their stuff. <laughs> I absolutely believe in it. I had um I was talking to a pod a comedian and podcaster last night in a show and I was like, we were just talking about shows and podcasts or whatever. And I was like, oh, I, d- I don't actually listen to your podcast because it's it's not for my demographic. And uh, my girlfriend really li- likes it. And I was like, oh, yeah, my girlfriend loves your show. I actually just bought her one of your mugs. And he goes, oh, man, if you would have told me, I would have just brought you one. And I was like, no, no, no. I know how important it yeah. is to just support people's work like and pay them for their art and whatever they make. So, yeah, I mean, it's. When I think, especially at this stage, when you you genuinely get someone to support you, it means a a whole lot. And I think the world benefits from that, from people expressing their joy that other people bring them. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's small town radio was a good venture and a good reminder of like the actual work that goes into making something successful and like. It's it's not easy to just sit down, record something, and go. You either need to have a large audience, or you need to have some just killer content. But even then, yeah. there's so much noise now that it's almost better just to have the market. Yeah, it's it's really challenging. Like that was what surprised me because Small Town Radio was my first podcast, and I didn't know how it was gonna go until we started like really getting into it i mm-hmm. thought maybe it's like okay yeah we'll have like a small listener base to start you know maybe like five to eight people and then you know it'll just snowball like things just snowball like we go from five and we get to 50 and then 50 to 100 then 100 to 500 thousand i yeah. thought it was just gonna like build by episode and that's like not the case at all and that was kind of a wake-up call for me but it was like we talk about on episode, the final episode is like, what was great for me about that show was one, it was awesome becoming friends with you and like working with you and like learning about the audio stuff, but just kind of getting in the routine of like the consistency, like, and being like, all right, I remember even before we started the show, I was like, listen, I want to do a podcast too. I will give you every Sunday, every week to make sure we can record and get something together. And just that, like, consistency and, like, working with someone was, like, awesome. I think it's also tough as an open mic comedian. You don't necessarily know where opportunities might come up. And so our our schedules by nature are not very consistent. Right. And I think, I mean, I think routine is very helpful for people. But there's also something where it's like, you're just not used to it. Going out and being like, all right, I'm going to go out tonight and not. So... A lot of challenges to it. Um, yeah. It, yeah. It, it was a good learning experience. And I feel yeah. the same I'm, way. I feel very fortunate that you were able to meet me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, and one thing is, is like the, this podcast, um, Don't Quit Your Day Job. This oh, was the, the show pod- Yeah. Oh, shoot. <laughs> This was the podcast that I wanted to do initially. Like the f- when this was my first podcast idea and I was like I really want to do this, but I didn't have any of the know-how and like I understood a lot of like how audio stuff worked in theory, but I didn't know the actual steps of like you need a mic, you need maybe a mixer or a recording software and here's like there's just if you go on YouTube and look up how to podcast, there's a billion ways to make a setup. And yeah. it was just nice because Connor's setup was very compact and very straightforward. And it, I was like, oh, this all makes sense. And like, if I hadn't done small town radio, this show would suck. Like the audio quality would be awful. Like, <laughs> I, well, I, you kind of hit the nail on the head in some ways for freelancers and people in the arts, graphic designers included, uh, photographers included. And you know this as a photographer. People underestimate what goes into making something creative. For instance, for photography, you show up with a camera, you get a photo. You show up with a camera, you get a lot of photos. You show up with a camera, you get a video. Like, that's what people think. But if you're 
something as simple as audio. Audio removes the visual element from a video. So it, mm-hmm. you're working with less elements. But just for a podcast, one that's like this. This is a fairly simple setup. We're talking over Google Hangouts. Mm-hmm. Um, simple. We have our own equipment, but that means we have two different recorders. We have two different microphones. We both have editing software that comes in a package that costs some money. Um, all those things, those little barriers to entry, and then figuring out how yeah. those all the software works, people don't think about when it's a creative process. Same with graphic designer, like going to school, understanding how different shapes and different different elements, colors, fonts work together, how white space works. Like going back to the logo, I've tried my hand at a number of different logos. Trevor and I were trying to figure out what worked best for curbside comedy. I had ideas, but I couldn't put it together. And I sent it over to Jack. And because of that experience, those years, probably close to a decade worth of experience, he was able to put something together. But when you hire someone, video, audio, photography, I mean, photography, you pay for the lens, you pay for the camera, you pay for the lighting, you pay for the knowledge, you pay for the editing. But people don't understand that, so they don't appreciate it. And they don't appreciate it financially either. They're not like, oh, I understand that you put, you've you put in hours, years worth of time. Um, yeah. So I, you know, you have a, you happen to have a camera. Oh, wait, I didn't realize it cost, you know, five, six, a thousand dollars with the lens. You just have the camera, so I'll give you twenty five bucks. Like, yeah, it's it's crazy to me, especially when it's like people hire these like photographers, at, like for comedy shows that are like these guys are actually beast mode, and yeah. what people like people think it's easy to do what they do, and they just have the camera. I'm like, no, like the like <laughs> I remember meeting one of them for the first time. And I recognize the two cameras he had on his chest and the lenses they had. I'm like, this dude is wearing ten thousand dollars worth of photography equipment, and yeah. that's like, and he knows how to use it. So it's and it's not just the gear; it's the skill. And it's like what you said: the barriers to entry, like just the software we use to get good audio on our our respective podcasts, like. We have a yearly Adobe license, and then we also paid like an, an additional like three hundred dollars for like a specific plugin Isotope, to do yeah. a lot of cleaning. Yeah, so it's like just an audio software to make this sound good and make sure you guys aren't hearing me licking my lips is like <laughs> it's like a thousand dollars. Like, yeah, it's crazy. And then the the amount of time like we spent hand cleaning small town radio. Yeah. God. I mean that is part of the learning experience. Like when I'm like when I make some when people tell me, "Oh, the audio on your podcast is so nice. It's so great to listen to." It's like, "Thank you. This only cost me like <laughs> 200 hours of my life." <laughs> yeah. It's that. And I guess the next step in our evolution is having a board that does that. That like you can put the software into it. It does it yep. as you record. But then that costs a ton of those mixers cost thousands. You know, yeah. hundreds, thousands and that's the thing where it's like, you just gotta, it's the same thing with comedy though. The same thing with comedy. Yep. Um, I guess it's, it's just the arts in general. It's like, you're not really going to pay for it unless you figure out, you know, unless you get the branding right behind it and, you know, you got Broadway and people are willing to pay a lot for those, you know, certain comedians. Um, yeah. But it's, I think that's the toughest thing. And that's as a freelancer, one of the things where, you have to realize where the value lies and what you can say. And like, I don't know. As soon as someone offers me a rate that's higher than yep. what my rate currently is, I'm like, that's my new rate. That is what I, yep. what I do because, um, you know, as a freelancer too, you have to like take care of your taxes. That stuff doesn't come out. So you have to remember that like, you're not really earning what you earn for an hourly rate. Right. Um, and so you got to price those things in, you got to price in your software. Um, Right. And it's like things like comedy too. Even though there is no upfront cost, like when we do comedy shows, like you you make money from comedy shows because you yeah. have a good business model. But most comedy shows you do, as a comedian, it is either free or you are making like ten dollars. Or you're paying and, for it. Or you're paying, and which is a scam if you yes. have to. But um like I have a log. I stopped recording. I used to record every stand up set I did ever. And I stopped after about a year or like year and a half when I got to about 300 stand up sets. And I just stopped 
I just like, I was like, I don't care anymore to record these. Like, it's just insane because I do so much. And it's like, if I have done something 300 times, I am still only getting paid $10 to do it, even though I'm so much better than someone who has done it zero times, you know, like it's crazy. That's the thing. And that's, that's where curbside comedy in theory comes in. Cause there's curbside comedy in reality and there's curbside comedy in theory. We are in reality. I love spending my mental time in the theory of it because I think it's a beautiful idea, but I don't like we got to we got to get it to there. Okay. So, okay. So, let's uh let's just wind back. So, what's the conception of cur- curbside comedy? What is depression. this thing? Depression. depression. <laughs> lots and lots of depression. Yep. It was dirt der- like yeah, it was like this was a uh, a child of the pandemic, a child of the parabola, the pandemonium. Yeah. We so we were trying to do small time radio during the pandemic in part because yep. we didn't know when I'd be back. We thought I'd be back in New York and just kind of pick it up yeah. from there. Um, but I think reality was setting in more and more. I'm like, Oh, I have no idea when I'm going to go back. I don't know if I'm going to go back, which I didn't end up doing. And um, I just, I was talking with my dad one day and you know, my dad's very good. He, he gave great advice during the pandemic, but it was one of those things where like, let's not talk about what could be. Let's talk about what is. Yeah, I'm just like, well, the only way to do shows right now is to do it outdoors. Like that's the mm-hmm. first clear step because that's the only thing you could. We realized we could do during the first part of the pandemic is outdoors. It's like, well, what's uh, you can social distance outdoors, and um, well, if that's the case, we just need some equipment and do it outside. Um, and I think that that idea. Well, so that's that's one part of the idea. The second part of the idea is you know going to where the people are with the shows. Um, But I think both of those ideas are kind of out there in the collective consciousness. I don't think doing outdoor shows was unique to us. I don't think delivering shows to people is unique to us. Trevor Glassman, who's been on this show, comedy partner, business partner through this, he had a similar idea before leaving New York. You've told me you've had a similar idea. Like it was something that was out there. Um, I will say like at the time you guys decide to start doing outdoor stuff, it was still a phase in New York City where it was like, you want to be near other people? Oh, God, no. <laughs> it was. And that was some of it. We started when there was still a lockdown. Our first show had oh, yeah. eight people. But it became clear um, that it could be repeated. Um, it, could, it became clear that this is something you can kind of do wherever. And so um, we, we knew from the beginning that we wanted to grow it. We didn't know how it would necessarily grow. So we did the first show, uh, I believe on May 8th, on my parents' front porch. We just invited some neighbors over. Yeah. And we didn't put out a jar, but at the end of the show, they asked for tips. Um, the way the show works, Trevor and I are the two comedians who do it presently. So we do two acts, about 15 to 20 minutes apiece. And then we do a Q&A. The Q&A came about because we both finished our sets and we were walking off. And then they, people started asking questions at our first show. We're like, well, we can't go up and talk to people because of the pandemic, so let's just answer it on the mics. And it's become a crowd favorite because so many people enjoy stand-up comedy but don't know about it, don't know the process, so it gives them an opportunity. We've been asked several times if we've auditioned for SNL, which, one, (laughs) thank you. Two, you do not know how the comedy world works. (laughs) (laughs) It's funny because the Q&A, like, you're right, it's just so many people just aren't exposed to the lifestyle or like know what it's about. It's like, you guys are this like novelty traveling vaudeville act. And it's, they're like, wow. There's some of that. Yeah. Some of that. And there's also some of, I, I feel, I believe in the theory and like the, where I want comedy to be. I want to, I think it's an educational piece for people who are interested in comedy that want to learn more about it. I mean, Trevor and I yeah. have been in New York. We've done shows elsewhere around the country so we have this knowledge, um, and I think Netflix, while I don't, I, I think there's something to be said about oversaturating a market and having providing too much money for people to do specials before they're necessarily at the top of their, not the top of their game, but their set's pristine. Um, I do think there's a lot of, to be gained for exposure to stand-up comedy. I think the interest yeah. is really high. Um, 
And it's really, it was really interesting because we reached out to the news after our very first show and we got an article in the paper and it went out and then everyone's just like, well, why don't you live stream it? There's a ton of feedback on social media and people were trying to find my parents' house to come to the show. And we had to move the show date, the show time, because we didn't want to, you know, police to show up. Yeah. Um, and we did have a few people end- who ended up showing up. We did three shows that day. Wow. Um, it was, it, it felt very promising uh, looking back on it now, but we realized, we were like, no, this whole, thing it occurs stand-up comedy you should see it live watching a special is kind yep. of cool but you gotta see it live especially yeah. at our point someone wants to watch someone who's figuring out comedy online like they want to when they could be watching anything else on their tv yeah like, no it's even even watching like at this point a lot of netflix specials i watch them i go this is terrible like and i think that's so much like you got to be there in person. You yeah. get the vibe. And that's something that people didn't get. There was definitely a Zoom craze at the beginning of the pandemic. It was like, let's just put everything terrible. on there. Hate it. Hate and Zoom. Hate Zoom comedy. <laughs> Trevor and I were like, we're not doing it. We're not yeah. doing that. There's, we've, we had made one exception for a nursing home because they had um, you know, people who were extreme risk and we wanted to be able to deliver stand-up to them. But we did it on a closed network. And they, we said no recording of it. Uh, obviously, we can't control that, but uh, you know the demographic. It's fair to say they might. <laughs> some of the some of the skills may be limited in the technology <laughs> area. But uh, yeah, it's kind of how it started, and it wasn't mm. a business at first. It was just a necessity to perform and looking at what is rather than uh, what may be. Right. And then, so you guys did a ton of shows throughout the the summer, and then you approached winter in New Hampshire, right? Yeah. So what was the move when winter started rolling around? I Oh, man, this last... So the, since the pandemic, and it's almost been a year since I left, March 13th is the day I left New York. And so I, mm-hmm. each step of the way was like... Well, what's the next step going to be? So we do yeah. all those shows, uh, just about 50 shows. We A big part of Curbside Comedy, which is something I've mentioned, is raising money for charity. Between uh, May 8th, that first show, and the end of the year, I think we did it's either like 49 or 50 shows. And we are like $4 short of $6,000 rates for charity. Wow. And so we kind of took it how, how like, moment by moment and we just you know took whatever bookings would come in and uh but it was clear when i moved out of new york in at the end of august that i need to start thinking about the winter i think my logic for not st- moving back to new york was the winter's going to be miserable oh yeah um, it sucks it yeah. sucks <laughs> and i moved so i found a lease that was short term in rhode island and so i could still do shows up in new hampshire and I was already thinking about what the winter could be. And so I was like, it's, you, if we're going to do this, you got to go somewhere warm. Right. So I just started narrowing down. Um, and Trevor, like, there's so much uncertainty during the pandemic. So much yeah. of it that neither of us could really say, like, are we staying in New Hampshire for a long time? Are we going back to New York? We both have apartments. What is it? So we decided... Um, we both looked at what was best for our lives and decided to move to Tampa at different, <laughs> we didn't decide to, that together, but we decided that it was the best move for us. And we, uh, moved down here and just are starting to plug away. I mean, we had 50 shows. We had people like, we good word of mouth. We were in the news twice. We had two feature stories on the television news, multiple yeah. articles written about us. And uh, we moved to Florida and we have done one show in three months. And it has been a really interesting time because between the end of shows, shows kind of wrapped up at the end of October in New Hampshire. And I moved in the middle of November down to Florida. um, Yeah. We decided that like, we're going to pursue this as a business. There's a real thing like, 
the idea of uh, this could be something more. And like I talked, I said it in theory, like in theory, this is the stepping stone. We have clubs and we have uh, doing shows or opening on a tour or something like that. There's nothing in between. There's, and that's a huge gap because the right. number of club spaces are limited. So why not bring comedy to the people? That's the thought. Like we are that stepping stone. It's yeah. not great money, but it's money. And um, like it's good for audiences who need to be more accustomed to stand up um, and comedians and good for comedians who aren't getting real audiences because they're doing so many mics. When I say real audience, I mean non-comedians. Um, and so we've been, while these shows haven't been going on, we've been building the business slowly. Like we brought in a mark, a couple of marketing people, uh, Piper Cub Creative as the, uh, the company that we are with. Um, and so we've been building social media. We've been figuring out the business structure behind it, how the model works. Um, and like trying to figure out all the marketing pieces because again, com- com- comedians like material and marketing are the two pieces, right? And that's where we're at. And it's it is super frustrating to be like, oh, we had all this un uh, unexpected success in the Northeast to pretty much come to a standstill. But I don't believe we are. I don't believe we've hit a wall. It's just like we're just waiting, right? Because once it happens, I think word of mouth, like we know we put on a good show. We know we have a good model. It's just, we got to let someone open the door for us. Yeah. So what, how have you developed as a comedian in your, your uh, curbside comedy adventure? I've basically just taken the best of your act. I'm like, I go up on stage with glasses. I, uh, I'm wearing that pink sweater and I'm just like, man. (laughs) I can't, I, right, I can't wear the pink sweater, right, guys? I can't wear the pink sweater. It's too stained with food now. Really? Yeah, it's kind of my like uh, lazy piece of shit sweater. So I only wear it in the house, and if I haven't showered, <laughs> <laughs> giving tips away to the audience. I haven't showered <laughs> in weeks, folks. If you see me on a video or a Zoom show, and I'm wearing a lavender hoodie, haven't showered. <laughs> um, I've. It's been the best for my stand up, honestly. Yeah. It's been so good. I left New York thinking I'd like seven ish minutes. I've been, I think my longest set has been 35. And it's not like I'm not writing on stage. I'm going through material. Um, yeah. Which, again, I think that's a huge barrier for, I think that's one of the things that New York struggles with a lot uh, in co- comedians' development. We all are forced into the five minute sets. But in order to be at a club, you need to be able to do 15. Well, where are you going to be able to practice 15 if you're only getting five minutes places? Like, where Mm -hmm. are you going to get a real audience? Um, And my goal has always been to try and get on a tour, like open for someone. I want to see the country. That's kind of the next step that I want my comedy career. I'm able to do that through curbside. But in order to do that, to open for someone, you need 15, 20 minutes. Um, So my goal became pretty quickly to get a longer set and... I did a lot of wordplay stuff in New York. A lot of like, a, a lot of the mindset was everyone else. Like, let's get to the joke as quickly as possible. And mm-hmm. I've been able to develop stories now and things that are more closely related, related to my life. I think in New York, I was a wordplay guy. Now I think I'm growing into a, a storyteller. Um, Definitely. And I have jokes that are longer. I, I went up on my, I didn't tell you this before. I went up on a mic for the first time in, tampa and i only did one joke one story that was it the entire set was one thing and that was (laughs) terrifying so i'm like i'm living and dying by this and it (laughs) someone came up to me and i just rewritten it and i know it works um but someone's like hey you're you're just your pace was off it's he said you're that was really well written but the pace was off so yeah um, it was a good that was like a big compliment it was a guy from la too sorry girlfriend just walked in Hello. Yeah. I know she can't hear me. I like she to imagine sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was just one of those things where like, I'm getting to learn so much about who I am as a comedian. I have more time to play, more time to just be on stage. So it's been huge. And I think, again, also, theory of curbside comedy, it allows other people that same opportunity. Right. 
Also, uh, tell, someone telling you your pace is off when you're used to doing 15 minutes and yeah. then you have to condense a joke to two minutes is like, no, your pace is off. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's also, it was, so it was too slow because I had rewritten it and I was, it was clear that I was trying to remember everything that I had oh, rewritten. Yeah, yeah. But he was like, uh, yeah, I, it should have been the other way. Um, but I have a joke and I won't tell you the setup, but I think you'll laugh at this anyway. It's just like, I don't look like that. I look like a scared altar boy. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, so it's, I will say I got I got one of the nicest compliments I've received in stand up so far last night in that one of one of our comedian friends uh, said to me, he goes, Maxim, you're getting good at riffing in a way that I'm envious of. And I was like, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. Catch me up here. Not even writing jokes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. That's good. That's good. I mean, it's it's so nice. It's nice, too. I think. Well, here's the other thing. So comedy audience is a big thing. Like that's why live comedy is so much better than Zoom because you can you get that feedback. But there's yeah. a thing too where comedians get um disengaged or they get overexposed to comedy and you don't get that laughter. Yeah. And so your whole timing is kind of thrown off or you're like you get insecure about jokes that should work. There are jokes that didn't work in New York that I loved that I was able to bring to quote unquote real audiences and they, it hit. I'm like, these work. And so now I have the confidence when I did it, uh, when I do it at Mike's, they're working. Yeah. Um, but I think that's the other thing too. It's so valuable. Um, and you're very good at this going up to comedians and telling them what you liked about their set, giving that type of encouragement. It's the same thing with like artists and freelancers, like give them the respect that they deserve and the props that they deserve because it's, valuable to them same with the comedian let's like i'm always surprised when it's a room full of comedians and no one wants to laugh it's like you hate this too like you hate going on stage and doing this so yeah you <laughs> you're part of it like let's let's try and be supportive of each other here it's like the the classic uh you're in a, at a mic and there's 40 people there and they're all comedians and no one laughs and then someone on stage goes all right, guys, you know you have to be up here too, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's one of those things I've always, I've been thinking recently. I'm like, I just want to go up and be like, man, this is the worst funeral I've ever been to. <laughs> I said, uh, I've been doing one where I say, uh, I explain that I got COVID twice and I go, that last bit wasn't even a joke. The, I lost my sense of taste. So, Do you have yours back? Uh, I think mostly. I don't have my I, smell I th- back. I, my smell is iffy for sure. I can smell like like vinegary things and like spicy things, but yeah, I can't I can't smell like a, just a normal candle. Basically, I I'm in the same boat. But I I mean I got COVID before you did, yeah, and it's still actually I'm starting to get a little bit back. And I'm like, oh, the world kind of smells bad. Oh yeah, I you definitely will get that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm but, I'm excited for it to return though because my favorite foods don't taste the same right now. Chips and salsa? Have you done that? Uh yeah, I can taste salsa. Oh, I, I think can't. it's it's hot enough. And I mean, generally my taste is back. I think I don't know. I didn't keep I didn't keep good good enough track of it. It was just like one day I was like, I can't smell anything. <laughs> yeah. Man. yeah, I think I always I don't know. It's always ironic when comedians come off stage after just performing in front of other comedians and go, man, that was tough. And then they don't laugh at anyone. Like, yeah. Like, you know, like, it's all of us. Let's all do this together. Yeah. Um, that's a good thing about curbside comedy, though. You get, you get those people who are there to laugh. Yep. Um, which is what you need. You need it. Real, real audience is incredible. They're, they're always, like, they're not always great, but compared to performing in front of comedians like if you can consistently make other comedians laugh and then you get in front of like normal people you'll just obliterate them well it's also interesting because i think comedians some comedians because they hear so many jokes have a warped sense of what's funny like yeah. i'm not i don't think i'm a comedian's comedian by any mean like i'm just mm. a silly guy and so it's like it's like sometimes it bends me in ways that I don't want to be bent. Like I could easily swear here or I could easily like, I don't know, say something. Someone had a joke and I did a little bit of crowd work to try and engage people. And they're like, they're, I was talking about eating 
hot dog eating contest and then I said, oh, I should train for that. How do you think I would train? Someone just goes, sucking dick. And I'm like, well, now I know they want me to say that at some point during my set, but that's not who I am. Yeah. <laughs> um, I riff a lot of things that I will never write into a joke. If I'm, ho- if I'm hosting an open mic, I'm like, there are things I say between comedians where I'm like, never going to say that again. <laughs> yeah. But I, I mean, I really believe that curbside comedy Again, good for the comedians, but it's good too because I've had a show where I asked the audience, how many of you have seen a live stand-up comedy show in the last five years? And two people raised their hands and that's because they both work at a, as ushers in a theater. So it's yeah. not by choice, it's by occupation. And all those people though, I'm pretty sure, they were there to see a comedy show. They had some interest in comedy. The fact is there's pockets of this country where there just aren't clubs. And it doesn't mean that those people shouldn't get some exposure to good stand up. So I think it I mean, does a lot for people. Like the, the most frustrating thing you hear doing this is, oh, yeah, we need more laughter now. We need more laughter. I'm like, okay, then book a show. That's how it yeah. works. Yeah, it's like we don't, there is plenty of laughter. There was even more laughter before the pandemic. And yeah. now there's plenty of comedians who would love to receive $50 to make you and your friends laugh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, that's that's the struggle. Like, we haven't heard back a, we, we've heard a lot of positive stuff about curbside comedy and the model that we've built. Um, now it's just getting people to pull the trigger. But I do think there's a fear. There's a fear that you're booking someone that's not funny. You don't know yeah. the person. Um, I feel like, like you said, you have one kind of have one shot. If you have one, if you go to an open mic and you have one bad exposure to that type of um, novice comedian, then you're kind of jaded. That's why I don't bring yeah. people. I do not. I'm like, you don't want to sit through no. this. And like, even even amongst comedians, like you make friends by being a repeat person at a mic. Because when you go to a mic, Sometimes the first time you're at a mic, you'll bomb. And that's how those people remember you if they're not typically people you cross paths with. So you have to go back and like keep trying and show these people it's like, oh yeah, they're funny. It was just like a weird set because we all have those. Like Yeah. That's well, that's the thing about curbside comedy too. It's been such a confidence booster because we don't we've n- never had a show that flopped. We've never had a show that is like we've had either trevor or i have had weaker sets but if you're able to do 50 shows in front of 50 different groups of people and you're getting laughs consistently you're like all right there's something here and confidence uh, jerry seinfeld says there's there's no such thing as too much confidence in stand-up i believe that yeah um so there's some like and i think that's true i think that'd be true for a lot of comedians who are able to get that type of exposure that they're going to do well um but it's just finding opportunities. And that's what curbside comedy will hopefully be able to do. Like our goal, yeah, we've talked about it. We want to, once we figure out the actual business model and how we can, how we work um, and get to a certain point to know that it's a real thing, we want to bring, we want to, we want this to be a thing for other comedians. We want to be able to help right. get them booked, get them the exposure um, because it's just, I don't know. It's better for everyone. It's like, it's a weird thing yeah. being exclusive now because um, then you s- can alienate yourself in some ways, but that's not like our goal is to eventually get those, get other comedians involved and like show them how this thing works um, to for their benefit and the benefit of the people that want to laugh. Totally. And like with comics, it's like, if you're able to provide a 15 minute time slot in the future for comedians, like 15 minutes on like an independent show is a really good chunk of time. Like, yeah, it's not five, it's not eight, it's not 10. It's like a whole 15. And you get a unique opportunity to connect with an audience and get in front of people that wouldn't see you before, potentially getting new followers, new supporters of your career. Yeah. Um, Yeah. There's, there's a whole lot of good um, that comes with curbside comedy, but it's just, you know, it's like, you got to remember the, I, I need to remind myself that it's a business too, and businesses struggle early on, especially when they don't have the network like we did up mm-hmm. in New Hampshire. 
Yeah, totally. I, I think that was the thing when you were like, I'm going down to Florida. It was like, oh, this is going to be a whole new challenge because you have no network there now. And it'll be really interesting to see how you do, like, starting from square zero. Yeah. Also, was... my girl, like, I just want to point out, my girlfriend just walked through the room. And it's so funny because she does this a lot when I record podcasts. Mm-hmm. Is she ducks under the camera as if this is a video podcast? <laughs> and she's 100% in the camera every time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I like mean, networking. Yeah, I think you were right, though. But my, I think the risk reward was pretty sweet because I thought, you know, if we can get this thing rolling somewhere where we have zero network, what's to say we can't replicate it elsewhere? Right. Because if, in my mind, I'm like, if you were able to build the network in Florida in like one winter and then you come back to New Hampshire and do like spring, summer, fall, and then you can like come back to like a place, a warm place during the winter, like I would, especially with how awful New York winter is, I would totally go to Florida to be like, I will just go to Florida to do a show one time because yeah, it's mean, so it's, nice. <laughs> I, I, I'm not. The- I mean, I don't. I obviously don't give away everything that we're trying to do because there are some things that we're trying to um, figure out on the business end to see if it works before you know. Yeah. Like I, we want to, we want to make sure that we know what we're doing in our market, um, and like have understood it fully before explaining it all. But I feel like we're close. We are close. We have kind of figured out a niche. Um of ways to get into our show so I, we never explain what Cur- curbside comedy delivers live stand-up comedy to events businesses and backyards we specialize <laughs> in backyard shows um <laughs> that was a little late yeah yeah it was like um but we so we have started to i think we're getting cl- like again i we were talking about this before the podcast i'm like i think the next two to three weeks are going to be telling because we've started to kind of figure out how we could break into areas, areas that we've heard positive responses, but just haven't gotten the the closing. And yeah. so, and then once that happens too, once we actually get shows going, the same as New Hampshire, getting the press involved, um, letting people know this is a thing because we are doing like, the other beautiful thing about curbside comedy is the charity aspect. We we can really be um, a vehicle to help redistribute wealth in a in a way yeah. that's supporting the arts and the local community that we're doing the shows in. Like right. that's the other piece. Um and so hopefully hopefully, you know, it figures out and hope it figures itself out. But I do like each time I record my podcast, what's up with me, I'm like, oh, next episode, next episode I can have something to share. And then it hasn't happened. So <laughs> gotta manage expectations. More like, what's not up with me? I mean, that's why I'm applying to be on Survivor. Got to have a backup plan. That's a more realistic backup plan. Yeah. 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 Instead of delivering comedy to someone right next door, I'm going to go across the world to compete for a million dollars. Yes. 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 <laughs> and buy GameStop stock. That's God. that's the did you Did you jump on that? Yeah. Okay. Totally. I, I was just like, I was like, it's bound, it was bound to happen. It's uh it's one of those things where I was like following it and I was like, man, this is getting crazy. And then on Friday, I was like, I have to buy a share of this, otherwise I will feel like I missed out for years. Like <laughs> So you didn't feel that way when people stormed the Capitol? You weren't like, Oh man, this is my one chance. <laughs> no, but yeah, definitely did not feel that way. <laughs> Interesting. All right, well, interesting. we're down to uh, we're down to our normal wrap up time here, but I want to ask you one final question before we get out of here. Do you, in your podcasting and videography and your freelancing and your comedy, do you have a message you kind of stick to, or do you have something you tell yourself to keep going? It's a great question. Um, do you have like an internal inspirational quote there that things- you think of? There are things that um, I remind myself of, and I don't do it often enough. I think I would be more motivated if I did remind myself of those things. But there are a few things. Um, I think reminding myself of how fortunate I am to be able to pursue what I want to pursue and remembering that I shouldn't waste the opportunity to do something because it's a very unique time of our lives. You can't do this at any 
at any point in any chapter. So there's a little bit of that. Um, and then I decided when I was in college about doing freelance that I really, it's important to, for me to be there for bigger family events, to have that flexibility. Like I want to show up to my nephews and my nieces' birthdays. Like I want to be a part of the family and have the opportunity to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And I think freelance, uh, there's some misconceptions there about like how much free time you have, build your own schedule. Well, you also need to work a lot. Um, but I think that motivates me being able to be there for the important events definitely is helpful. Um, and then just like creativity, like I, I'm the type of person who goes in, like, I'm not going to do a good, I'm not going to do my best job at something unless I believe in it. And I'm really passionate about it. Yeah. And knowing that having done other jobs where I'm like, I can feel my passion at, 50%. So I'm only given 50%. Like I could do so much better, but I can't get over that hump. Um, being able to see, like take a step back from my day sometime, be like, I love this. So I, that motivation's still there. This is why I'm continuing to do it. Um, cause life's a whole lot simpler if you have a regular job. Oh, so much simpler. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> like there's this sense of, well, will I be, will I be the best employer for a job that i i don't love as much as this and i could be maybe we'll see but i think the motivation to do what i love is is really strong yeah no that's great i think that's what should keep people going is you want that passion and that excitement about what you're doing like if you're not excited about anything you should probably figure that one out yeah and go out and find something that excites you yeah, like booking a stand-up comedy show in your backyard through curbside comedy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I am passionate about giving these two New York guys money. <laughs> Maxim, are you surprised that I haven't once asked for a client during this? That was like 80% of Small Town Radio. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that being said, yeah. you can hire me. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. as a part of the closing credits here, uh, please hire Connor. Hit him yeah. up on Instagram and hit him up for your, all your ed audio editing needs. Or video. Video or just, if you just want to talk, you can pay him to just talk. I guess so, yeah. there. I'm thinking about doing something. Uh, you can find it on my Instagram, but I might just do office hours once a week and like, I don't know, maybe go on Twitch or something for like your podcast or something. Be like, First come, first serve. If you want me to do anything in my specialty, I'll help you no, at no cost. Maybe it's like... That's if a cool you know, idea. You do it a few times, maybe we'll build something, but you can kind of try out my services. And I'll also provide structure during my day. So I'm deciding on how I might want to be doing that, but um, I, that's something to look out for um, if, if it comes to fruition on my social media. Cool. I like that idea. But yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for coming on. This is fun i like this this is nice <laughs> yeah you texted me yesterday and i was like i actually was thinking right before you texted me like oh i should just call maxim see what's going on <laughs> yeah we haven't talked in a bit <laughs> yeah so stay yeah, tuned I, for our next podcast on the phone with maxim and connor <laughs> yeah right it's like the whole pre-conversation it's like that should just be a bonus episode where we just talk about technical bullshit <laughs> i i honestly thought at one point you might just go yeah i've been recording the whole time <laughs> <laughs> yeah awesome well we uh I, I do have to go but we will talk soon um so thank you so much for being on i uh, appreciate it um everyone at home if you're listening follow connor on instagram check out his youtube channel follow curbside comedy go to his shows book a show of C curbside comedy let him in your backyard um yeah, that's dog friendly. You know, one of the only dog friendly shows in the country. Yeah, one of the only dog friendly shows in the country until New York opens again. So, <laughs> <laughs> gotta capitalize. All right. Well, yeah. Thanks again for coming on. Appreciate it. You're welcome. This All right, has been well, Don't Quit Your Day Job with me. <laughs> Name redacted. Name redacted. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, thanks for tuning in, quitters. I hope you enjoyed this episode. You know that what to do. Follow him. Listen to more episodes of my podcast. Check out Small Town Radio if you want something light and cheerful and uh, something that me and Connor made. Um, until then, I will talk to you guys next week.
Bye.